there's definitely a place for this vaccination because there's been recent research carried out on this virus across Europe and including Ireland. And this study was very interesting. It found that 100% of the, the sample farms, they're all dairy farms, had bovine coronavirus circulating. They were all positive, zero prevalence. They were positive, each, all of the farms. While in Ireland, 57% of the farms were positive on PCR. So they had active antigen virus uh, present on the farms. Hello, I'm Stuart Childs and you're welcome to the Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. As the focus on animal numbers from an emissions point of view intensifies, animal health and its role in efficient animal performance is increasing in importance. Genetics for health, while very important, can't do it all and vaccination is going to be critical to both animal health and performance while also contributing to reducing antimicrobial usage. A new vaccine against bovine coronavirus has recently been brought to market. Today, I'm speaking with Sarah Higgins, ruminant and equine veterinary manager with MSD, about bovine coronavirus and the risks associated with it. But I started by asking Sarah to explain the umbrella term of BRD, or bovine respiratory disease. Bovine respiratory disease, or or as you said, BRD there, um, I suppose it's an umbrella term, really, of which pneumonia will be the main feature. So, you know, most farmers and vets would, would term it as pneumonia. But pneumonia really is when you have lesions within your lungs so or the cattle's lungs, so pulmonary lesions, while BRD would also involve upper respiratory tract disease as well. So like inflammation of the nose and the windpipe and so on and so forth. Um, and I think despite like, you know, a massive uh, amount of research done across the world on BRD or bovine respiratory disease, it is a massive cause of mortality in cattle. And in Ireland, it's the number one cause of death in cattle greater than one month of age, year in, year out. Okay, so I suppose, um, again, the reason I've uh, decided to talk to you again this, at this stage of the year is just because, so this affects all classes of stock, but it really seems to impact on the young stock. So the zero to one category stock. And we spoke in the springtime about vaccination to get them through the first 12 weeks of life. So we get them over the the, the milk phase, we'll say, and get them reared and get them out, uh, out of the house. But now we're moving into that period and we've possibly even gone through a spell there because of the weather being so poor that um, it's kind of August in the month of July, basically, or September even in the month of July scenario. So we went from very dry weather into wet weather and talking to vets locally, there's been a share of pneumonia. I'm using the wrong term there now after just saying about it, but um, there's been a share of of respiratory disease in stock. And I suppose people have less and less time, obviously, and anything that you can do on your terms is what I always say to people is better than having to do it on the animal's terms. So if you can vaccinate for something that you can kind of hope to prevent you have a bit more control over your time, whereas when the animal gets sick, you've no control. You have to go and deal with them and you have to ring your vet and so forth. So what's the the situation or we'll say, what are the factors that are influencing this um, BRD in the young stock and why are they more susceptible to it than the older stock? I suppose from the young stock point of view, their immunity wouldn't be as well established as older stock. So they may not have encountered certain viral agents in their life yet. Therefore, they haven't got the antibodies in their system. Um, And particularly if they haven't been vaccinated, their own immune system hasn't been bolstered or enhanced by a vaccination program. Um, And you also mentioned that the the vets are are talking about increased levels of respiratory disease in the last few weeks. And that's really down to stressors. So I think regardless of the animal's age, whether they're baby calves or weighing an age or, or, or even adult cattle, cattle just don't do well with stressors such as, you know, change in temperatures or, or heavy rainfall. Um, and their immune system is, is compromised, you know, as a result of that. And they're ultimately susceptible to disease and in particular respiratory disease to develop that. Um, so I think if we can kind of implement, you know, a good vaccination program to help bolster their immunity, it will help them fight uh, certain viral and bacterial uh, agents that are associated with respiratory disease. And I think as well, people can't forget that also parasites are associated with, with respiratory disease in Ireland, namely lungworm, which is known as Dictyocolis vivi paris. So you can kind of divide the pathogens or, or the bugs, as farmers would often call, cause them, into three different groups. You have viruses, bacteria and the lungworm. And, and this time of the year, a lot of, of coughing stock can be as a result of lungworm. And the the weather conditions right now are very favourable to lungworm. Um, you know, very, very kind of mild, muggy temperatures and a very heavy rainfall as well. So just, uh, Sarah, then in relation to the lungworm, so that's probably the gateway kind of scenario for a lot of this, really. So people, 
um, maybe getting lungworm in young stock now, as you said, the weather gone very poor, so the conditions are very tricky for young stock at the moment. Um, maybe poorish intakes on, even though they might be on nice grass, just very wet grass. Um, some people might have a lot of the, be on low levels of concentrates at this stage, so they they might be just under a little bit of pressure, and then that lungworm is opening the gate for for the 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 other bacterial and viral infections. So what's the best way to deal with the lungworm first and foremost, I suppose, and then we'll we'll talk about the viral agents then after that. Um, lungworm uh, can be controlled, I suppose, in a few different ways. You know, good pasture management, um, also good strategic anthelmintic or, or worming treatments or dosing, and also vaccination. Um, so depending on the time of the year, so we'll say, for example, springborn calves, you really kind of need to be putting them out onto low level contaminated pastures. So preferably not pastures that have been grazed by first season grazers last year, if that's possible, or a pasture that, you know, might have a low level of contamination um, in line with strategic uh, worming protocol. Then for, we'll say, your autumn born calves, you could consider uh, implementing a vaccination program against lungworm. There's a vaccination called Bovillus husvac, and it's a live oral dose. It's a little different to some of the other vaccines farmers would be used to using. And it needs two doses, but the calves need to be eight weeks of age. That's why it would suit your, your autumn calf, sorry, your autumn born calves more so than spring. They require two doses, uh, four weeks apart from the age of eight weeks of age, and they can't be turned out then for two weeks thereafter. And really what that's doing is it's allowing the calves to have uh, exposure to a low level of contamination on the pastures so that they're able to develop their own natural immunity against lungworm. Okay, so that's not really feasible for the springborn animal as such in, in the Irish context anyway. No, not with that kind of time frame. You have yeah. to make sure the calf is eight weeks of age and then two two doses, four weeks apart and then two weeks pre-turnout. So it kind of suits your autumn born calves more so. Okay, and uh, just then moving into the, the the viral and bacterial agents, then we'll say so. What uh, we'll say, can you can we cut it off at the pass as such with the appropriate lungworm treatment? Maybe, or is it still going to happen? Like so, even if we have our lungworm management right, our animals still at risk. As I said, is the is the lungworm the gateway that lets in the bacteria or the viral infection? Or even in spite of the, the the lungworm scenario, if we have everything done correctly in relation to our lungworm, are they still at risk of getting some viral or bacterial infection? That's a good question. Uh, I think regardless whether the animal has lungworm in their system or not, or whether they've been exposed to it, they're still going to be at risk of both viral and bacterial uh, causes of respiratory disease, unfortunately. And that goes for all animals, not again, not just this kind of age, less than a year. It's adult cattle as well. There's always that possibility of viral and bacterial uh, pneumonias. But often what we find in respiratory disease, uh, we see it in the regional veterinary labs reports, a lot of the outbreaks can be associated not just with one so you might get samples coming back positive for rsv pi3 coronavirus and or manheimia hemolytica pastoral and side of their both bacteria also mycoplasma bovis is creeping up a good bit uh, and or your lungworm as well so often you get like a mixed bag so if you have multiple different agents involved in the infection your clinical outcomes can be more severe so you get more severe clinical signs and, and ultimately maybe poor prognosis and, and um potentially more mortalities as well okay so with that in mind so um like there are some farms that have a lot of issues with pneumonia and would have often been put down to housing potentially um but is vaccination something that all farmers should be considering or what way should people go about this to find out whether what they are they doing what they're doing is right or should they be augmenting what their strategy is in relation to dealing with this Vaccination, I think I, I mentioned in our previous podcast, it's part of a kind of a multifaceted control measures. So that would incorporate, you know, good housing, so good ventilation, air movement within your house and at that time of the year, um, you know, good hygiene management or hygiene practices, good biosecurity management as well, and overall good management, farm management practices. But vaccination is one of the vital components in that control measures. Um, and should every farm be using vaccination? It, it all depends on their 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 history of disease. And I think knowing that bovine respiratory disease is the number one cause of mortality in cattle greater than a month of age and that every animal is susceptible to disease, I think people should be implementing a vaccination program against BRD, whether that's encompassing IBR vaccination, cover against RSV, PI3, bovine coronavirus. 
that will be a case by case basis, you know, and again, that's going back to diagnostics carried out by your own uh, attending veterinary practitioner, but also maybe post-mortem results if you had mortalities in the past as well. Um, and kind of then implementing then a correctly timed vaccination program for your herd, you know, so that you can, you know, when to go in with what you need to be covered against at certain times of the year and to what age animals. Um, so it's kind of really case by case. And that's, that's why it's so important to engage with your own vet because they know the history of your herd and they know the results and diagnostics if they've been carried out as well. Um, but I think as well, just you're saying, should every farm vaccinate? I think prevention has always been better than cure. But now more than ever with antimicrobial resistance, which is a major public health threat across the world, you know, we should be really implementing good disease preventative measures, which would include vaccination. And I think as well, everyone knows that there's now much more, uh, I suppose, better or promoting better prescription of antimicrobials and things like that since the new EU legislation that came into effect last year, which is 2019-6, um, that we really need to kind of uh, promote disease preventative strategies which would include vaccination and i suppose people often get put off by the price of, of vaccination um but in reality like i always say it's you see the price of the or you see the the, the, the sum that you pay for the vaccines but you never see the actual cost of the, the, the even the one or two cases of disease that can occur because you kind of just write it off as part of the vet bill for the year or whatever but like those cases can be two and three, four hundred euros a piece uh, when they occur. And that would pay for a lot of vaccination, wouldn't it? Exactly. It's a really good point. And I think as well, a lot of farmers will think of, you know, the call out fee or the, the animals they lost. But people now are becoming more aware of the long term consequences of, of disease and productivity and then pro- ultimately on profitability on the farmer. Um, so like heifers that have a bout pneumonia in their early life can have a massive reduction in their milk yield in their first lactation of up to 525 litres and also delay to their first lactation. So that that's, you know, that, that's costly in itself. But you have to think of that, factor that into the cases that you have. And I think as well, we probably discussed in our last podcast episode, the subclinical cases are yeah. massive. So we only see the tip of the iceberg. But if you have a batch of calves, 20, 30, 40, 50 calves, you know, you might have three or four of them displaying clinical signs, but there's another co- cohort that are subclinical. You know, they have damage there, they have an infection going on, but they're not displaying the clinical signs. And they also can be influenced, uh, I suppose, negatively on their productivity in later in life as well. Just in relation to, you mentioned the coronavirus there earlier, and you've actually launched a vaccine there only a couple of weeks ago in, at, at towards coronavirus. I suppose we have to be very clear that this isn't, while, while it's called the coronavirus, coronavirus has been in, uh, around for a long time ever before COVID-19 became a thing so why what was the the impetus it wasn't COVID-19 was the impetus for MSD to get involved in this area you'd seen some indications that this is a, a, an increasing problem I suppose and what are the what what why what is it uh, what what's the fallout of this coronavirus in stock we'll say yeah, so, so the impetus, I suppose, it wasn't the, the pandemic, uh, as this the development and the research for this vaccination uh, started back in 2019. And just, uh, I suppose, a bit of history about bovine coronavirus before I go to the vaccine itself. It was actually first identified in cattle in 1970s, associated with scour. And then in the 80s, it was associated with spiritual disease. So it's gone back that length of time uh, associated with uh, bronchopneumonia and calves. Um, so bovine coronavirus, there's three distinct clinical syndromes it's associated with in, in cattle. So it's got your neonatal calf diarrhea, which is your calf scour, which a lot of people be familiar with because bovillus rotavec corona would protect against that in calves, uh, baby born calves or newborn calves. Uh, winter dysentery in adult cattle, which is a profuse watery scour in cows. Um, and you can get milk drop as well with that. It's more prominent, seems to be in Northern Ireland than in the Republic of Ireland. And then finally, your BRD, your bovine respiratory disease. And um, there's definitely a place for this vaccination because there's been recent research carried out um, on this virus across Europe and including Ireland. And this study was very interesting. It found that 100% of the the sample farms, they're all dairy farms, had bovine coronavirus circulating. They were all positive, zero prevalence. They're positive, uh, each, all of the farms. While in Ireland, 57% of the farms were positive on PCR. So they had active antigen virus uh, present on the farms. Um, And even going back as far as 2014, 
Ron O'Neill, who's head of virology in the Department of uh, Food and uh, Agriculture, Food and Marine, he published a paper showing that 23% of respiratory outbreaks were associated with uh, bovine coronavirus in young stock in, in Ireland. Um, that was under the three months of age. I know we're focusing on a, a slightly older stock here today, but it's just shown the significance of that virus that has, has been circulating for quite a while. And it is present there. It's ubiquitous. So it's, it's found in both healthy and diseased animals. So cows could be going about their day to day life with you know not displaying any clinical signs but it's the younger stock tends to be younger animals uh, newborn calves and wanelands that can have this disease and like other brd symptoms you get you know you get a, a persistent kind of non-productive cough because it affects the mucus formation in the trachea and you get a nasal discharge an ocular discharge increased rate of respiration fever off form all the usual uh, clinical signs associated respiratory disease but what we can see as well just from a lot of the excuse me articles published this virus seems to really open the, the gateway or the airways to other pathogens uh, and it seems to have a very high correlation with RSV, PI3, Mannheim hemolytica and mycoplasma bovis as well. Um, so yeah that's that's the the basis of, of our, our new vaccination and the vaccination is called Bovillus nasogen C and it can be given to, uh, at the day of birth to, to calves. So is that focusing on, the, it's probably appropriate for people that maybe are calving autumn, calving cows now in the next couple of weeks or currently st- are just starting it. Um, but is it a, is that to cover a 12-week period again or is it kind of a longer life period that you're looking at in that scenario? It, it, it has a duration of immunity of 12 weeks, so it's aligned with our other vaccination that can be given at the day of birth, Bovillus and Chains RSP Live. So if you give both, they both can, are licensed to be given together. Uh, two mils either nostril but if both are administered on the same day you're getting that 12 week uh, duration of immunity and really you're getting them through that critical period you know especially at spring where you've got large volumes of calves hitting the ground you know and you might be tight for space and and, uh, you're getting cover for the three viral culprits there associated with with pneumonia and calves. And I suppose how important is the scour element there um, Sarah like with that corona as you said already Rotovic corona is like that coronavirus has been mentioned multiple times in relation to scouring calves, but this vaccine, will will this help against that as well? Um, so I think it's very important to, to say that they're, they're very different vaccines. Okay. So Bovillus nation C is licensed for respiratory disease, so it, and it's a live intranasal vaccine. It works in the mucosa of the nose, while your rotavec corona is an inactivated parental vaccination, meaning that, that it's given into the muscle two mils um, to, to pregnant heifers or cows, three to 12 weeks pre calfing They work totally different. One is an active immunity and one is a passive immunity. And your rotavec corona does not cover against the respiratory. So the location of cover isn't the respiratory tract, while your bovillus nation C, the location of cover is your respiratory tract. And I think actually as well from a scarring point of view, from the RVLs, coronavirus actually is reducing in frequency and detected samples been sent in. Uh, rotavirus remains the number one um, isolated pathogen in, in calf scours, while coronavirus actually has reduced significantly over the past few years in, in the Republic of Ireland. They could synergistically work together if you have coronavirus, because I think it's, it's important. They're not different strains. So if you're on a farm, whether you get the respiratory disease or whether you get the calf scours, it's, it's not to do with strains. It's just kind of a complex interplay between the, the animal itself, how it reacts to the, to the viral agent when it's exposed and the level of exposure it is gets to the virus as well. Okay, but there definitely would you assume that there maybe I'm speculating here now, but you'd assume that there's an association that if you can reduce the level of coronavirus through the intranasal vaccine that you're after bringing to the market now, that you're going to obviously potentially uh, alleviate potential temperature spikes, which obviously can lend themselves to scouring kind of animals. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, I, if you have any sort of, I suppose, disease, whether it's respiratory with temperatures, you're just, your immune system is going to be compromised. So you could succumb to infection, whether that's a scour or a navel infection or, you know. So yeah, overall, you will be just enhancing their immunity. Yeah, so but it, it has the claim against, uh, as I said, respiratory, both coronavirus, respiratory yeah. upper respiratory tract clinical signs and reduce the nasal shed as well. So from their discharge from their nose, you're going to reduce that as well. It's complex now what you're talking about there, right? And people tuning in are going to be going, God, what vaccine did you say there? When should I be using the type scenario? What's the best way that people can go about this to put a really robust herd health plan in place now? And I'm talking about across the full spectrum, not necessarily just the bovine respiratory disease element of it. What should farmers be doing? Like, in theory now, the weather is a bit rubbish at the moment, obviously, so it's putting pressure on people. But in theory, 
are now supposed to be coming into the kind of the generally the relaxing half of the year from a dairy farmer's point of view. So time to catch up and get get, get up to speed on bits and pieces maybe that have been left by the wayside all all along while we've been busy breeding and calving cows and so forth. So the hard health element of it, what should farmers be doing to, as I said, have give themselves a good robust uh, hard health plan? I suppose there's two actions I think you can do. The first one, uh, which is simple if you have free time and just go online, the bovillas.ie uh, on their page have a build your own vaccination calendar. So you put in your own information, your name, the type of industry or, or system you have and what diseases you want to cover. And it'll give you a guideline of, of vaccinations and what time of the year. But I think you the, 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 the most beneficial action you can do is to sit down with your own veterinary practitioner. And you can use that kind of calendar that you get from bovillas.ie or MSD Animal Health's webpage, and then the vet can tweak it. But I think your own vet, their knowledge, you know, can't be beaten in relation to the, the epidemiology of your diseases on your farms. Um, and they, they'll know what diseases they see at what times of the year, what diagnostics have been carried out the previous years, you know, what sort of samples were taken and what do they come back positive as. Um, and they'll also know your post-mortem results if you've had any deaths. And as you said, not just in relation to respiratory disease, but if you had other sorts of uh, casualties or deaths in the last year or two on your farm. Um, so by engaging with your own veterinary practitioner, they will guide you into implementing a correctly timed vaccination protocol that suits your farm. And I think we've discussed a lot of vaccines here, Stuart, today, and I'm not saying that every farmer needs to go out and get all these. By all means, they will be, it'd be great at preventing disease. But I think, you know, your own vet will really tell you which one or two or three vaccines or four vaccines, whichever the case may be, that you need to have in your vaccination program and to build a good herd health plan. Okay, and I suppose is it worth mentioning maybe as well that the AHI have a, a parasite taser that's in, in place there at the moment that farmers could engage with their vets in relation to that because there's a change in the legislation there since the 1st of July so it's probably important that people will get good advice uh, around the product that they're going to use from a parasitic control point of view like you were talking about it earlier but what's the best way of doing it of course is is going to maybe vary depending on as you said farm to farm like and it might sound like it's kind of a pass the buck type answer but it's it is really the case like that two farms right beside one another could have very different uh herd health plans like depending on their system of production um the intensity that they're farming at that kind of thing couldn't it well, absolutely the, uh, as you said two neighboring farms and, and even would say one farm could be open one could be closed you know one could be buying in a lot of replacement heifers of unknown vaccination status or unknown disease status and may or may not be good at quarantine and an animals as well so all of these come into play and, and not just for for your virus and bacteria but also your parasite control as well and i think as you said animal health ireland uh, and uh your Tasha parasite control that's another route to go and, and incorporate that into your herd health program it's not just the vaccination element I suppose the general synopsis of it is really that there are a multitude of vaccines out there that people can use. I think there's always going to be a place for antibiotic usage for those clinical cases. Um, you know, obviously antibiotics are just for bacterial infections. So sometimes some viral infections, you may just get away now with using just an anti-inflammatory, you know, but for the for the bacterial infections, uh, vets will still rely on your antibiotics. They'll always have a place, but they should be used correctly in the right circumstances and for the you know the right dosage and for the right length of time and i think it's vital that we all as vets and as farmers we all have a role to play in reducing the the level of use of antimicrobials in in cattle across the country and i suppose it's it's our part to play against the antimicrobial resistance crisis at the moment as well okay so thanks very much sarah for coming on and uh, explaining that rather complex area of brd again but like it, as it isn't it isn't easy like and and like listening to this podcast isn't going to educate everybody on what to do exactly like they do need to go and talk to their vet so thanks very much for coming on and in fairness to you it did make what is complex r- relatively st- understandable anyway so i appreciate your time that's all for this week's episode of the dairy edge podcast and my thanks to sarah higgins for joining me on this week's show don't forget to rate review and subscribe to the podcast you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. And for more information, go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie. I'm Stuart Childs and join me next time for your Dairy Edge.